Hi, this is Kate, and you're listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today we have episode 368 for March 18th, 2024. Got a great interview for you today, a very important and very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about medical privacy, healthcare data, uh, in particular in the U.S. is That's some scary stuff to get loose. That is, you know, beyond just having extra marketing stuff being pushed at you based on your medical conditions or procedures you've had or things like that, it's very, very personal data and has some serious potential negative impacts in the wrong hands. And this is very different than basically any other kind of privacy information we we tend to talk about on this show. And it's something that I don't understand as well as I do other topics. So I thought it was really important that we dedicate a show to it. And so today we're going to be talking with Kate Black, a lawyer with a proficiency in healthcare privacy and healthcare data. So uh, we're going to talk about that today. And obviously in the United States, a lot of this comes down to a very old law, actually, called HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A. And while you might think that the P in HIPAA stands for privacy, it doesn't. HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Now, while it does talk about privacy some, this law was written or enacted in 1996, which was... You know, certainly before the internet was really a big thing and before our medical records and health information was digitized and centralized. And I think a lot of us in America have misconceptions about what HIPAA really is and what it covers. Uh, and I think we, we tend to believe, oh, you know, that that is special. In the United States, we have crap laws for privacy, but hey, at least we have this medical privacy thing we called HIPAA. Uh, and it really kind of doesn't do, I think, what you might think it does, which is what we're going to talk about today. So real quick, before we get to the interview, I'll do my usual glossary of terms, kind of prep work. One term that's kind of thrown out there is called on-prem. That's short for on-premises. And uh, when we're talking about computer infrastructure and data storage and things like that and processing, the difference we're making there is whether or not it's done on on the grounds, on-premises or in the cloud. And so in a lot of cases, for privacy reasons in particular, uh, companies will want to keep the the computers that are actually running the processes and the data that they're processing local because they want to control it. So that's what we mean when we're talking about on-prem. We also talked today about PHI, that's personal health information, uh, an EHR or electronic health record. And by the way, these are often specific legal terms of art. It's not just a turn of phrase. It's actually something that carries specific requirements and procedures under laws like HIPAA. And then finally, we talk about a couple uh, departments in the United States, HHS, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, and the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission. All right, I think that's enough of a preamble. Let's get to our interview with Kate Black. Kate is a health privacy expert focusing on the use of new and emerging technologies in digital health and biotech. Prior to settling into a law firm, she was the first privacy officer 23 in me and worked at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, that's a great background for what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I want to do a show, and I've been wanting to do this for some time, about medical privacy. It's something I've personally been worried about, and I've, I think there's, I've just seen some really disturbing situations over the last, I don't know, six to 12 months that have really given me pause. So I, I want to dig into some of that with you today and, and either freak our audience out or put their fears to rest. I'm afraid it'll probably be more of the former, but a lot of this revolves around HIPAA. In the United States, that is kind of the go-to, you know, privacy legislation where we could point to and we say, hey, I've got rights to privacy for this information. But I think it's widely misunderstood, and maybe I think people give it more credit than it might be due. So let's start with the basics. I want to find out where did HIPAA come from? It's actually kind of old, and you know what is covered by HIPAA, and maybe more importantly, what is not covered by HIPAA? Yeah, you are correct in saying it is an old law. HIPAA was enacted in 1992, so uh, a little bit younger than me, but but not that much, uh, not that much <laughs> younger. 
It was enacted in a time where healthcare looked a lot different. You went to your doctor's office, you had a long-term relationship with that individual. They likely stored your medical record in paper form and uh, sitting in their office. So it it was really uh, initially focused and tailored to enabling those doctors and your provider team to share and exchange records in order to facilitate your treatment and the payment for that treatment. So it really allows pretty broad sharing for entities that are covered by HIPAA, which we'll get to, for any sort of treatment, payment, or operational purposes. You don't need an authorization or consent or any sort of patient involvement with that. It oftentimes, uh, on a daily basis, I'm sure right now in the ether, there's health data flying about you back and forth between many entities for those purposes. Um, and we want that to happen to some extent because if I get hurt when I'm visiting New York, I want to be able to to get the care that's relevant to me when I'm there. Right. Yeah, sure. It is only applicable to a small set of entities or individuals, those being healthcare providers like your doctor or a nurse, a health plan or a healthcare clearinghouse. You may think that that sounds really broad, but the definition of a healthcare provider is limited to those that use and exchange electronic information utilizing standard transactions. Standard transactions, a really deep definition, suffice it to say what that boils down to mean in everyday, you know, lingo is that the data is uh, submitted to a health insurance company for reimbursement or to submit a claim. So any sort of healthcare provider that's not submitting a claim to health insurance isn't going to be covered by HIPAA as well as any sort of consumer app that doesn't involve a provider at all none of that will be subject to HIPAA. That's not to say that HIPAA is the only dog in the fight, but it certainly mm. is the the largest and the one with most, I think, cultural and historical significance. All right. So it sounds like there's going to be some room for loopholes in there, which we will dig into today. <laughs> Another thing I'm curious about with HIPAA is there are certain rights that you have, whether or not you know you have them or not, and there are certain rights that you can't sign away if you try, I think. I'm not a lawyer, but that's my understanding. <laughs> it, how does HIPAA fall in, the, in that? Can I waive or sign away my HIPAA rights? Is it easy to do? Could I do it accidentally? HIPAA generally has fewer rights for patients than the omnibus or newer privacy laws that we see passed today. So we've all become very kind of comfortable and familiar with the right to get access, the right to delete, the right to request or have your data moved. HIPAA certainly has some of those flavors, but it's really focused on an individual's A, right to get access to their designated record set, which is a subset of their medical record, and B, the right to limit or prohibit the sharing of their health data in certain circumstances. Those are pretty limited, again, because the whole nature and purpose of HIPAA is to enable a healthcare system that is uh, personalized, educated, and well-functioning uh, on patients. So patients do have that right to get, get access, but beyond that, there aren't the same types of, of patient access rights as you'd see in other laws. So, again, I want to understand some basics because I think a lot of us take this stuff for granted or maybe don't stop to think about it. And so I want to I really want to make sure we understand this. So within a given medical office, like my primary care provider, who within that office has full access to my full medical record beyond the doctors? I, and I assume like nurses probably. But what about like the lab techs or the people who are drawing my blood that are working in the same office? What about billing specialists all the way down to like receptionists? I mean, is it wide open to anybody who works in that office or, or are they limited? Generally, Yes. The HIPAA rules and security rules do require that there are an access control framework in place and that access is managed. That said, it does not require any sort of least privilege or limitation in who could or should get access. So it is logical that based on the roles in a doctor's office, every member of that workforce would need access to your medical record. And generally speaking, that access is not limited or segmented based on your role. So if you access the medical record, you can generally access it in whole. Wow. Okay. There are various and many complex uh, analyses on what you could use or access that record for, how you could share it, when you may disclose it to a third party. So um, obviously would not be allowed to just snoop through a record to find an interesting surgery uh, that you had or, you know, curious to know your dating history if I thought you were cute. Mm. 
That, those would <laughs> right. be uses that were uh, limited and impermissible under HIPAA. But nevertheless, there's nothing in place to prevent somebody from doing that. You'd have to get caught. Correct. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Or, uh, uh, or audited, right? So if, um, I, oh, okay. if there's an, an audit log of my access and it's clear that I'm only looking up information related to sexual orientation and I am a lab tech or sexual health history, for example, and I'm a lab tech, the security or IT team could probably pretty easily discern that that's um, not a permissible use or that your um, use of the data is outside of your role. And, you know, you'd be subject to workplace, you know, training and remediation based on their controls and policies and procedures. All right. So I hadn't even thought about that. So audits, how, how often are they done? Are they surprise audits? Who conducts them? <laughs> Tell me about the audit process. <laughs> the HIPAA security rule requires that you do a yearly security assessment. That assessment would be a review of the totality of all of your security controls, administrative, physical, and technical. And it, uh, it includes the requirement that audits are performed. Each of those audits and the nature of those audits would be subject to the organization. The HIPAA security rule is uh, flexible based on the size of the organization and, and how you can implement it. So um, it could be every year um, for many and most large organizations like a hospital. Um, they would do kind of a full audit every year. The audit of access controls, you know, that would be, again, tailored to the organization and what they, the security team thought was appropriate um, for, for that set of operations and the folks in, in their workforce. You say security team. My primary care physician doesn't have a security team. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. at this point, they probably outsource that. Um, <laughs> yeah. if, it's a, if it's a small doctor's office, it's probably a paid service uh, third party. But um, under HIPAA, they are required to meet those security controls. Okay. So in some way, shape, or form, they should be thinking about those things. <laughs> so, yeah, right. it's, uh, it's, it's um, kind of a trickle-down effect for smaller doctor's <laughs> offices, I imagine. All right. So, and you mentioned this case, if I, if I am at another provider, let's maybe it's an emergency run to a hospital that's not in my area. Maybe it's, I'm going to a specialist because something's new cropped up and I need to go talk to a, somebody besides my primary care physician. And, you know, one of the first boilerplate forms that I'm handed whenever that happens is give me access to your medical history so I can help you better, which, you know, which I understand. When I do that, when I say, okay, yes, you can access my medical records so that you can help me better from my existing providers, what does that actually give them access to? Does that give them access to my entire medical history? Is it maybe just only the relevant parts? Does it give them how long are they granted access? And then finally, do they, do they make a copy of my record, which means that that's one more place that my records could be, you know, exfiltrated from? That does allow them to query, pull, transmit, get access to your entire medical record with certain limitations. There's a reference under the law to Section 2 or Part 2 records. Those are records that relate to your mental health or substance abuse treatment. Those records have a higher standard for access and sharing. And so if those records are of interest or needed for your current treatment, you will sign an additional authorization form in order to get access mm. to those. Um, that has very specific kind of disclosures and information about how the data could be used. If it is not uh, part two data and it's just general medical record, you know, you came in for a wellness exam, you struggle with uh, migraines, whatever the case may be, all of that is accessible to your new care team. It's generally a one-time pull, but they could continue to get access to it and continue to receive additional information on an ongoing basis if and, if and when they want to. There's no sort of legal limitation or protocol for how much they could get access to or how often, so long as they have a legitimate treatment purpose for getting access to that data. And, I, and did they make a copy of that data, or is this just a longstanding permission to access it remotely as needed? It all depends. It takes so many flavors, shapes, and forms. There are currently um, pretty sophisticated health information exchanges. So most of this has become digitized, that your doctor's office using a uh, really big, probably pretty legacy and old, funky electronic health record system would query a health information exchange and pull the data into their system, make a digital copy, integrate it into their systems, and then treat it as part of your record there. Interestingly, then, kind of if you roll that, that ball further down the mountain, if you were to see a third provider 
the third provider would query the same health insurance and health information exchange and get the records from the previous two doctors. So it would probably be a lot of duplicative information since mm. provider two already has the information from provider one. But regardless, would all be aggregated and sent. And that, that kind of snowball will continue as your care goes on and on and on. All right. So you mentioned breaking this data down into, you said a part two type data. Are there, how many, how many parts are there? And, <laughs> and, uh, so, how does that break down? Under HIPAA, those are generally the two buckets. You have your standard medical record and then your part two data, which is, uh, substance abuse and mental health. And then there are various additional kind of outside of, uh, HIPAA medical records. If your provider is not subject to HIPAA, those types of records and the information that would be included would just kind of balloon from there as providers are subject to medical record laws in all 50 states. All right. What about minor versus of majority people? If I'm under 18 or, or whatever, it, uh, is my medical data treated any differently? Is, or is it kind of like the the criminal justice system where my, my juvenile record doesn't carry to my adult record? Is there anything weird just like that, depending on your age? There are different requirements uh, for access and use of health data Based on your age, they vary by state um, and what is considered the state of majority or uh, just how the, the regulations were structured in each state. Generally speaking, all of those laws and those requirements really focus on whether or not a third party um, non-provider could get access to your data. And they were set up such that teenagers could get a little more privacy from their parents and whether or not parents can still get access to the medical records. That generally does not change a doctor's ability to get access to your records. So if you are a minor, the same sort of data access protocols would apply to an adult, with a small caveat being that parents may also have access rights in addition to in addition to yourself. It's really complicated and varied based on the state that you're in and, and how the requirements work, especially now I should call out post the reversal of Roe and a lot of the women's health and reproductive health laws that have been passed. You know, young women, I think, face a, a complicated spectrum of uh, rights and limitation and rights based on the state that they're in. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Yes. Can anybody access my medical record without my explicit permission? When I'm going to these doctor's offices, I'm signing papers that give them access. Are there any cases where that my medical history could be accessed without my permission or or knowledge? Because those could be different. Like maybe they could notify me, but I didn't have a choice. So obviously law enforcement would be one that would immediately come to mind. But my insurers, I guess they probably have access because I probably gave them access to have their service in the first place, but maybe other insurers that aren't my directly in, my direct insurer, maybe. For instance, another insurer who wants to market something to me, get me to switch providers or something. My employer, they probably provide my service. How much access can my employer have to my medical records? What about my spouse or maybe my next of kin if I if I just, if I die? What who else can access my records without my permission? Under HIPAA as long as you meet a permissible disclosure, you can share that data with anyone as a provider without the individual's authorization or consent. So if I am provider number two and I'm querying for your health data, I don't actually need to inform you or get your consent to get access to it under HIPAA. I, as your treating doctor, have the right under HIPAA to get access to that data. Again, because we're trying to facilitate coordinated care for you so you don't have to repeat all the same tests. Um, and we'd but like- don't I sign forms to allow them to do that? I mean, every, every time I go to a doctor, they have me sign a form that gives them access to that. It sounds like that's not necessary. Those forms generally meet two um, of the doctor's goals. Number one, in order to further share or disclose that information, they they would like your consent so that they don't have to worry about one of these exceptions or requirements under HIPAA, then they just have broad authorization. And two, to inform you that they are going to be pulling your data and make sure that you are aware and comfortable with that. There are state kind of regulatory requirements around that, but generally speaking under HIPAA, that document that you're signing is not, not a requirement. And hmm. And so they could share it um, with any other provider for your healthcare treatment purpose without your knowledge or understanding. Um, again, that, that sounds really kind of creepy and risky, but there's a huge benefit to me if I walk into a new provider's office sure. and they know my entire health history and what medications I'm on without ever having to meet me or get that document signed. And, and so there's, I think, good benefit to that um, to offset some of the risk. 
The other more or less traditional use cases, like sharing information with a law enforcement entity, for example, does not require consent or authorization. But generally speaking, recently there's been a trend towards both state and the federal government encouraging that sort of notification and authorization through various policy levers. I will say that in every corner of this conversation about who and when your health data can get accessed, it's going to be a new set of complicated dynamics and regulatory requirements. So um, it's it's not a situation where you can say with ease that, you know, under all circumstances, law enforcement can get access to your records without you knowing. But there are certainly regulatory pathways for that to happen. And it does happen on a regular basis. All right. So what about my like my employer? What about my next of kin? What about my family? So sharing with a third party that is um, not kind of a, a sanctioned entity under HIPAA does require your authorization. You can either through indicating that that person is your agent or giving them a medical power of attorney, uh, authorize an individual to get your access to your data. Otherwise, it is generally prohibited. Your employer is generally prohibited from getting access to your medical records, as are any sort of other third party. So uh, uh, your doctor's office or the hospital that you visit should not be releasing these copies to someone that they don't have a verified relationship with for a permissible purpose. It's it's funny, as I've done privacy stuff over the years, I've learned that there's some really interesting privacy laws out there. Like, for example, there are specific privacy laws around accessing my video rental history. There are privacy laws around what books I check out from the library that are explicitly <laughs> that, are, that are covered because these cases come up and they were fought in their one, I guess. And it feels, it, I mean, it feels, I guess, like medicals. I have almost less rights with medical than I do in some of these every other specific cases. Yeah, it's interesting because the kind of genesis of a lot of health privacy law gave the rights and uh, protections around health related information to the providers as sort of the provider's IP, right? Like they did mm. this surgery or performed a new set of treatment purposes and that that was theirs um, that they could then utilize however they thought was appropriate. And obviously that's changed over time, but it wasn't, you know, bodily privacy was not something that was uh, baked into the origins of the country. And so I think in a somewhat non-surprising way, we now have a really gnarly patchwork of who's protected where and when and what is the data flows that I can't fully complain about because it does keep me uh, paid and employed. <laughs> um, but it's certainly not something that is consumer friendly or accessible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, job security, certainly for privacy folks these days and cybersecurity. Right. I think I know what the answer to this is, but to be clear, so if I go to, if I've got my primary care physician, but now I've gone to a second provider for some other thing and I sign the forms and they get my data from my primary care. Does it go both ways? Does that open the door for my primary care physician to get access to the, the whatever new thing I'm doing at the second provider? Yes. Yeah, so if the second provider determines that your primary care doctor should be informed of that for treatment purposes or to operate their healthcare service, then yes, they can share that data back. You can, as you as you interact with these providers, you can request to limit access and say both, okay. you know, I don't want my other doctors to know about this. I also don't want you to submit this to my health insurance company. I want to mm -hmm. pay out of pocket to it. And I want this just to be between you and I. And you do have the right to limit it. Those those rights are not absolute. They're subject to certain exceptions and requirements. For example, if there's some sort of public health threat or life uh, threatening condition that that they need to, you know, share information to protect your physical safety, um, they can do that. But for the most part, they are obligated to abide by any sorts of requests for limitations. So as you're describing that, that the, and this always triggers a thought in my head, and I don't know if this is just me wishing, to wishing this and manifest it, but it sounds to me like the, the kind of the thought process here is that they need to be a data fiduciary. Like this data they can exchange it with people with the sole purpose of helping me, like for my for my health and my benefit. And if it's beyond that, then it's limited. Is that at least the spirit of some of this? Yeah, I think that's a good mental model to apply to the situation. I would say there's a couple of pillars by which that would apply, right? They can do it for your benefit or in order to treat or support your care. They can do it when and if they need to get paid for that care and be um, reimbursed by a health insurance company, 
or if for their own operational reasons, they get audited by their tax advisors, um, they need to release the data, they can do it. And they'd say those are the three things they can do it, you know, for their own protection, for your protection, or because it's America to get paid. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Uh, okay. So you already mentioned this, but uh, my medical file is no longer a pile of papers in a manila folder locked in a metal cabinet uh, in my doctor's office. They're all digitized now for better or for worse. I think I'm probably on the whole probably for the better, but nevertheless, who does then have my data? What third parties? And what I'm worried you're going to tell me is that, oh yes, there's one provider that handles all of America because everybody uses the same thing. And there's a single point of failure for all of this, but what third parties have this? Are there a lot of them? Does it open that up to supply to supply chain attacks? I'm, I'm worried about that. So wh where are my record stores? Who has them? So there are two very large vendors for electronic health records. The companies uh, behind those are Epic and Cerner. I'd say together, they probably have a 90% market share wow. across okay. the United States. They have their own various on-prem and cloud implementations that providers can customize and implement. And it's incredibly expensive and takes a very long time to, to do that. And I think after that, there's a really long tail of other providers and third parties that you should consider and think of. Some of those are smaller electronic health records providers. For example, uh, dental uh, services have their own kind of mm. EHR. Some there's some pediatricians um, that have kind of a specialized EHR system that they'll utilize. And then there's all sorts of other connected devices and facilities. You have the lab that does your blood work that will be on its own kind of lab management operating system. There's medical devices, both uh, patient facing as well as hardware devices in an hospital that will have cloud storage uh, of the information. There's health information exchanges, all sorts of additional kind of ancillary parties that are part of the healthcare ecosystem at this point that have now all gone online and all have um, bits and pieces of your data. And that, um, that I think is the part of the healthcare ecosystem that most folks are just not really thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You know your doctor, you interact with your doctor, but the truth is your doctor probably has 15 medical devices or systems in their office that they are regularly utilizing. Um, if it's an OBGYN, you know, think of the ultrasound system. Um, that company is going to access and use and store that data. Um, and just, you know, you think about how that would multiply across the spectrum. Um, and those are devices you interact with, as opposed to all of the other sorts of um, devices and vendors that you don't interact with. For example, your healthcare system uh, probably has implemented their electronic health record. They then have employed, you know, anywhere between 10 and 500 vendors to help them audit and monitor its security, keep it up and running, manage data centers, you know, flag any sort of odd behavior. There's just an endless list of, of vendors in the ecosystem that may inevitably touch that data. If the doctors are required to audit themselves, uh, access logs and, and periodically, what about these third party systems that are storing my data? Are they held to any security standards? Are there any certifications they're required to have? Are they, do they have to undergo audits? Do those audits actually come from third parties and not just self-reported? I know a lot of times audits sound really good until you realize that it's all voluntary, <laughs> you know, it's, oh yeah, we're doing great. Thanks right. for checking. Right. Yeah, all of the vendors and service providers that service HIPAA-covered entities are referred to as business associates, which is a fun, made-up legal word <laughs> that basically means service provider that is performing functions on behalf of or providing services to a covered entity and gets access to protected health information. All of those entities are also regulated by the Department of Health and Human Services. They also have to comply with the HIPAA security rule. Uh, so they have also implemented all the same kind of security protocols, including audits, access controls. Generally speaking, providers and all covered entities are required to do an assessment of a potential vendor when they're getting onboarded. I'm sure you are aware of the kind of paperwork nightmare that goes into auditing potential vendors and reviewing their security framework. Those processes can be as effective or as box checky as the organization wants them to be. So it's really a mixed bag of whether or not the organization is taking it seriously. I will say that 
overwhelmingly, especially for large organizations, the threat and feel, fear of a data breach is very, very real for healthcare organizations. So they do put a lot of time and energy into making sure that the uh, security of their vendors is, um, is in compliance with the law. That said, you know, there's just chains of chains of business associates and subcontractors and subcontractors. And in any chain, there's always weaknesses um, that are hard to discover. So it's, it's not a um, perfect picture, but I do think most organizations are trying. Okay. That all sounds good in theory. In your experience, how well do these companies secure this data? Have there been major breaches? I mean, there have been some that we've heard about, but I mean, there's some that we haven't heard about. Are they required to disclose this like any other company now with, with data breaches? Would we know if there were failures? In your experience, how how well is, have they managed to cleave to these regulations and processes? Well, again, note that the regulations were passed in the mid-90s. Security sure. and the internet has changed a lot. So while they try to be uh, living and customizable and risk-based, um, I think there's a lot of folks in the industry who think especially the security rules need to be updated. For example, uh, as part of this HIPAA security rule, encryption at rest and in transit is, for lack of a better word, a suggested uh, a control, but it is not a required control. Oh my! So okay. if you choose not to implement it, you have to kind of document your rationale to do so. Um, obviously, there's a lot of folks that think that that needs to be uh, changed very quickly, but that gives you a sense of kind of where and how the regulations were written. You know, I think like any other industry, there have certainly been huge data breaches. Many of these organizations are are trying but it's not a perfect it's not a perfect patch um and they're not you know you when you think of the folks at your doctor's office or at a large health system you know it's not the same type of cybersecurity professional that you would find at a large tech company the background the type of connected devices is just it's really different the landscape is completely different so you know it's it's really a just different mental framework when you think about risk well, and we've been talking about secondary, but there's tertiary levels to this too. Even our, even those providers that are behind the scenes that you've never heard of, they are in turn relying on Microsoft Azure or AWS or some of these other things that have also had breaches because those, you know, data storage providers or com cloud computing providers have failed to secure their systems as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and AWS and Microsoft and all of these cloud service providers and uh, background service providers especially in the place in the space of HIPAA, will say, we offer a HIPAA compliant service. You have to be responsible for going in and turning on all of the appropriate controls and setting it up in right. a way that is compliant with HIPAA and meets your risk. And so they're, they can only do so much, um, so to speak. And then it's really on the organizations themselves to make sure that they have implemented an AWS instance that is you know, fully protected. And I've run across cases too, where there's, and some of these contracts that they sign with each other in the contracts, they say, we could do it. Like you, you said, we, we can be compliant, but it's up to you to make sure it happens. But they both point to the other one, you know, like, you know, like, oh no, that's on you, but I'm going to sign a thing saying it's on you. Wait, who's doing it? Right. And then how many trainings right. do I have to take to get up to speed with the types of controls and administrative settings I need to implement? And that's why I think a lot of times, especially in healthcare, the um, appetite for change or moving to new vendors is is relatively low because there's a large burden to to making that happen. You said something earlier in the interview that 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 I did not miss, and that was I think you said that even I don't have full access to my records. So let let's get that on the table. What as as the the person as the patient here, what do I have access to? Is it can I ask my medical providers any of them to say give me a copy of everything you've got on me? And if I wanted to, then could I say, and I, by the way, also, I want you to delete all records from your system for me. Are they required to comply with that? So you do have the right to get access to your health data. Under HIPAA, it is referred to a right to get access to a designated record set. A designated record set is a subset of the data that a covered entity or a healthcare provider would likely have about you. It does include your kind of core medical record, but it does not include likely a lot of additional ancillary information. Like? 
<laughs> um, so it's it, it can be technical and determined uh, based on the organization. But so core records would be things that were important or relevant to your diagnoses. So information about what conditions you were diagnosed with, how you were treated for it would be part of your designated record set. Every blood test and blood marker test that you've done in the last 15 years may not be included. But, um, mm. you know, I think what's interesting about it is that uh, it's a regulatory definition. So each provider or covered entity would do an analysis or an assessment of the information of the data they hold and make a determination about what would be part of or constitute the designated record set. So what wouldn't they want to give me? I guess I'm missing it. What, what Under what conditions would they say, well, give him, he's asked for everything, but okay, give him this, but you know, don't give him that. I, I guess you mentioned one thing, maybe proprietary things. Maybe I'm undergoing a cancer treatment that is revolutionary that they don't want to give out proprietary intellectual property. Maybe I could, maybe that. What kinds of things might they not want to share with me? Um, you know, I don't know that it's not that they don't want to, don't want to share it with you. I think there's administrative burden to um, some of the information. So for example, I could see a situation where you want all of your data. You may have spent a lot of time on the hospital's website and have been searching around and trying to get a sense of like what services they offer, whether or not they treat this really specific condition. You've downloaded a bunch of white papers and academic articles that they've published about it. So they have things like your clickstream history and your IP address and uh you know, your device ID and identifier, none of that information would be involved in your designated record set. So mm -hmm. if you wanted your medical records, you'd get them, you wouldn't get the kind of ancillary data that the organization mm -hmm. may have about you. And I think it's not because they don't want to give it to you so much as, you know, as we just talked about, there's hundreds, if not thousands of processors and business associates and um, data sources within their organization from an administrative perspective, the regulations kind of carved out the data that they believe is kind of core or fundamental to your healthcare and made sure you got access to that without overburdening organizations, making them also get access to all of this other kind of data. All right. So it sounds it almost sounds like an overbroad discovery and legal filing. Like it, you know, like you can ask for the things that are relevant, but you can't ask for all the company's records on everybody, right? Or right. Whatever. Right. Exactly. Okay. I think one of the most important parts of this, and I want to make sure that we talk about it, how how do marketers get my health data? With all these protections supposedly around my data and limitations on who had, who, who could access my data, how is it that the marketers get this? How is it that I suddenly receive offers for drugs or, or medical services related to some recent health condition or a medical procedure that I just got? How is that leaking out? Sure. And I think one of the, the biggest kind of key to that discussion and discussing marketing and data flows here is the discussion and focus on the world of entities within the healthcare system that are not covered entities and are not subject to HIPAA. And all of those are subject to the same general marketing requirements and rules that every other company is subject to, which is basically very little here in the U.S., so a pharmaceutical company, for example, is not a covered entity. If you sign up for and do a telehealth service to talk about your, again, migraines, that's likely not a covered entity. All of those um, companies that fall outside of HIPAA are not subject to the restriction on marketing because under HIPAA, you're generally not allowed to market to individuals using PHI. Uh, there are some exceptions. So, you know, you can let a patient know about a treatment option or materials that are relevant to their care. You can't market to them, you know, a gym membership. You can't, you generally can't use PHI for marketing purposes under HIPAA. All of these other entities that may get access to your data as part of, you know, your care continuum and life online and offline certainly can and will use that data for marketing purposes. When we're talking about online digital marketing and behavioral advertising, in the last year or so, both HHS as well as the FTC, which is, you know, used to be kind of a, a chihuahua in the fight, but has really stepped up to the table mm -hmm. and, and tried to focus on this topic, have, have put some much more stringent guidelines in place in how and when tracking technology can be used to market based on sensitive data, including health data. But it's still a work in progress, and the guidance on the HHS side is currently being challenged in court. 
On the FTC side, you know, they've made three or four um, enforcement actions, so certainly not enough. Everyone's paying attention, but not enough to truly police the space. And um, I think state laws um, that focus on these issues, you know, are also just getting revved up um, and the opting out of do not sell or share is just really starting to get started. So overall, I would say that uh, many fewer of, of uh, the, the entities that you interact with for healthcare purposes are subject to HIPAA than you think. And as a result of that, participate in commerce just like every other company, regardless of whether or not the data they process is your health data or your shopping data. I mean, some of the things that I've always wondered about, and I think some of these are true and some of these you know, may be apocryphal, but certainly things like location tracking on my phone. If I, if I go to an abortion provider and my phone is tattling on my location, that's going to give something away about me, and about my medical. If I go to a, any other specialist that the only thing they do with this building is mental health or something. And, and I can tell that you've visited that place, you know, every other week for the last six months, that's going to tell me something. Web trackers. I know that was a big one. Uh, the, the Facebook uh, tracking pixels and things like that were all over a lot of these third party medical websites, coughing up lots of information about you, even though you're on a uh, supposedly what you would think would be a, a HIPAA restricted portal. You know, I, search engine queries, you know, you, we tell our search engine things we don't tell our closest, you know, our spouses and our closest friends, we search for things that we wouldn't tell anybody, but the search engine knows credit card companies. I'm always, I'm often worried that if I buy something on a credit card, how much detailed information do they get? If I go to the pharmacy and I pay for my thing with a credit card, they, how much information do they get about that? What, what about some of those cases? And, and you talked about the FTC, they specifically just handed out a major ruling on good RX. And I think that's kind of tied in with some of the things I just mentioned. What happened there? Yeah, so I guess taking a step back, you know, there's there's HIPAA and the healthcare provider rules that apply to situations where basically your health insurance is being built. So your traditional health system. Then I think there's a second set of laws that apply to what's known as consumer data. Those would be your new state privacy laws like the CCPA as well as the FTC. And there's uh, overlapping and I think complementary enforcement in that space. And then finally, kind of the new wave of laws cropping up that are very focused on reproductive health care. And the state of Washington, for example, has has really been at the forefront of that, that specifically regulate and oversee how data will be used um, that can be uh, inferred to or associated with your reproductive health care services. Um, and so what you're talking about here is is the second bucket of laws that are consumer facing. The FTC, as well as uh, a lot of these state attorneys generals, have um, tried in earnest to really get a handle on a lot of this use and sharing that, that has been alarming to folks. I think especially as a result of the pandemic, when everybody's health care and search history became really sensitive and moved online very quickly, and there's there's been a ton of media coverage of, like you mentioned, tracking technology, marketing practices, the fact that a lot of these telehealth services are not subject to HIPAA. Um, so, so that second bucket of regulators have really tried to step up and tried to implement some reasonable controls on data sharing. And for the most part, they have focused on the use of sensitive data for marketing purposes, both as retargeting as well as how the third party platforms utilized uh, for those services are reusing and monetizing the data. Um, the FTC has shown a real concern for situations where sensitive data is um, being picked up by a third party platform. Um, they are tend to be pretty specifically concerned with Meta and Google for, I think, the reason that those two entities, you know, have a ton of data. They have a very sophisticated ability to connect data from disparate sources and build very sophisticated profiles on individuals. Yeah. And then, to your point, target very specific healthcare services to those individuals. That is both a blessing and a curse, depending on who you ask. And I think in healthcare, a very complicated topic. If you are a provider of healthcare services, let's say you're a telehealth platform that services mental health needs, it's really hard to get mental health uh, and get the kind of drugs and therapy that you may need when you are at your bottom. And, and there's been studies about this that getting those therapies online can be a much more accessible and efficient way to do so. 
But you don't know if that those platforms exist unless you Google search for it or get an ad for it or somehow otherwise are made aware that those services exist online. And so there is, again, a benefit to knowing that those services exist. There's also a benefit to the idea by some that, you know, if I'm searching for depression treatment and I get an ad for a telehealth service, yes, that's a little bit creepy that Google now knows that I have uh, or I think I have depression, but I may get the care that I need where I need it. And weighing that good with the potential risk that on the back end, Google and others are then amalgamating this very rich and detailed analysis and assessment of who I am and are willing to and do actively monetize that so that if I am another company and I would like to leverage a targeted advertising campaign through Google, I could say, find me all the depressed people or the people that you think are depressed, you know, and send them an advertisement for, you know, my gun shop down the street. And that doesn't feel very good at all, obviously, and and may have really um, disastrous outcomes. And that's not to say that uh, Google doesn't have rules in place for how and when you can use uh, sensitive data and what kinds of things are appropriate to show ads to. But it is still a pretty self-regulated entity. And that's why the FTC and other regulators have tried to step up and go to Google and, and Facebook's customers and say, hey, guys. Uh, you can't use these platforms this way. We don't think it's appropriate to use and share health data in this mechanism. Okay. I want I want to, before we wrap up, I want to bring out a few specific cases that I've specifically worried about myself uh, in recent months or have either because of friends of mine that have brought it to it, my attention or stories I've read or my, or even my own personal experience. One of the things I've often wondered is I've heard that pharmacies sell data about their clients at the, at, the, at the back door. And I'm not sure if that's just, that, that seems very vague, but like for one of the things I was thinking about it, pharmacies often you go in to pay for something and it's like, Oh, this is going to be $500 for this prescription. Oh, but I've got a coupon here. Would you like to use this coupon? But I think I'm guessing what happens with a lot of times when you sign this coupon is actually part of accepting the coupon is agreeing to share information with somebody, for example. So it might be, it might be something you weren't even thinking about. Oh, coupon. Love that. Yeah. I'll pay 25 instead of 500. That's great. But they might not realize what they're doing. In fact, I, in most of the cases where it's happened to me, the pharmacist never shows me the coupon. I don't sign anything. I don't read anything. It's like, would you like to use it? And it's like, I say yes. And all of a sudden, my cost goes way down. Sure. So most retail all most retail pharmacies, the big ones for sure, the CVS and Walgreens of the world, are HIPAA-covered entities, right? Like they, they are critical to the provision of health care and submit claims to a health insurance company. So they generally cannot use or sell your data for that kind of marketing purposes. It is very common, and I think, you know, an accepted practice in the healthcare industry to de-identify data and share de-identified records for a variety of purposes, both commercial and non-commercial. HIPAA has a very clear de-identification standard. There are 18 fields that if you remove them, it's considered de-identified. You can also get an expert to do an expert determination if you have a unique data set. But for the most part, A lot of folks follow that kind of standard de-identification. You can imagine that that data could and would be re-identified at some point down down the line when a third party gets a hold of it, totally outside the knowledge or purview of the initial entity Mm -hmm. that shared it. So that does happen quite a lot. And I think a lot of uh, marketing and targeting can be uh, developed off of the, the inferred information they get from those data sets. But I don't think uh, what is happening is exactly what you think. I think in this case, you get the coupon, you scan it. Likely, the insurance company then gets a claim that says, you know, this individual gets this drug or this therapy at this pharmacy. Will you reimburse for this? There was a coupon applied to cover the copayment. And that data can get aggregated in a claims database that then pharmaceutical providers in particular are very savvy at getting access to the de-identified versions of and being able to again target marketing based on that. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I don't think it's a one-to-one, you know, sly consent or authorization. I just think again the ecosystem is wide and varied and if you're a pharma company, you know, there's 2500 data sources that you could pull data in in order to do marketing and brand awareness campaigns. Everybody I know, every provider I've worked with today, 
and, and I think this was accelerated somewhat after the pandemic or during the pandemic, but they all have patient portals now. Mm -hmm. So instead of waiting to go in the office where they hand you a clipboard with papers on it, they have you pre-check in or, and manage your appointments through their patient portal. And it's not, I mean, my doctor doesn't own that portal. It's definitely, it's absolutely a third party that they are contracting to do that. Are those third party portals safe? Are they secure? Are they private? If, if I, cause there's a, there's a messaging facility there and I use it with my doctor a lot. It's great. I mean, I don't have to set up an appointment. I can ask him a quick medical question and within 24 to 48 hours, I get a response, which would be, it's a lot easier for him and for me. I get it. Uh, but can I assume that those messages are secure? Can I assume that the, the data in these portals is, is safe and, and not being data mined or hacked? You can assume that they are as safe as other interactions and data storage of covered entities. The patient portal and patient messaging is a required functionality in what's referred to as certified electronic health record technology, meaning that um, in order to get certified and be sold to these providers, it has to comply with the HIPAA security rule amongst a bunch of other requirements. So the portal, as part of that EHR, is going to meet all of the HIPAA security rule requirements. That's that's not to say they are foolproof, um, but I'd say they are as just as secure as any other sort of data storage that your provider is doing. I'm sure I read this somewhere, but like one of the things that bugs me well, for one anecdote about the about the portal thing is whenever I sign up for or I, whenever I have an appointment coming up, I today I always get an email two weeks before my appointment says pre check in, use this third party portal. And that portal invariably has me regurgitate my entire medical history. I'm sure they want to just make sure nothing's changed, but it's not pre filled. So so they didn't have that. The, the, apparently, the portal didn't have it to begin with. Right. Just say, oh, yeah, this is I'm no longer taking this drug. And I've had this surgery since I last I was last in. It's fill out your entire medical history. Uh, but I've also seen this on like tablets when I walk into the doctor's office, too, and they kind of replace the clipboard thing. And I swear I, I, that I read an article saying that one of those uh, tablet based sign in systems one of the check boxes that was on that thing was, and you agree to share this for marketing purposes with something. And if you didn't uncheck it, then you were giving that information away. Could that have happened? Or is that, am I just making that up? Generally speaking, the authorization needed to allow your PHI to be used for marketing purposes is a really like ancient form that you've probably seen. That's like the full page that says HIPAA authorization. I yep. so-and-so allow for X, Y, and Z. So you know it when you're signing that kind of document if there was some sort of HIPAA violation and there was a checkbox on one of those forms, I wouldn't be that surprised, um, but that would not be a compliant approach for a marketing authorization. Um, okay. And interestingly enough, I just kind of two cents. There is some, I think, data quality and patient matching reasons why they recollect all of that data. A, they want to verify that the information that they're matching about you on the back end is you, and there isn't any sort of national patient identifier so each platform mm -hmm. and information system has oftentimes a different subset of data elements that it's using to ensure that, you know, me, Kate Black, is the Kate Black that they've accessed um, for my background information. It's not a great system. There's no real reason why this couldn't be solved, but unfortunately, just one of the many inefficiencies in our health system. Well, just as a, another annoying anecdote is uh, twice with two of my doctors in this case is I've one, I forgot to fill it out. One, I refuse to fill it out. These, they, these, these emails that say pre-check in and I get to the thing and they, they don't mention it. So I bring it up like, Hey, you know what? I got this thing saying to pre-check in and I didn't do it. Like, Oh, one of them was like, Oh, yo, we, I have to turn that off. You, you weren't supposed to get that email. So, so like they didn't, right. they didn't, not only did they know about it, they didn't want it. And right. the other one was, Oh yeah, we don't look at that. Don't worry about it. And it just ignore that email. Right. And then here's the clipboard anyway. So please fill this out. <laughs> right. And then we'll type up that information for you. It's great. <laughs> Love it. It's fantastic. It's, uh, I think, just just a, a kind of legacy of a time before doctor's offices went digital. I think a lot of doctors and providers' offices are still managed by uh, a generation that is used to doing things a certain way and just haven't updated their practices. Mm. So you worked at 23 me, So this is going to be a very interesting question. I, I've been warning people for years not, not to use DNA analysis and heredity services because it just seems like there's nothing more personal to me than my DNA. I mean, my DNA is me and I, and I worry, and, and there's certainly I've got reason to worry based on things I've read that this data is potentially being abused. And sometimes, and if you've ever, uh, was it a movie or a book, the, 
the Henrietta Lacks story where her cells were used in perpetuity and she signed away her rights to that, I guess. I worry about how this stuff could be used in abuse because, I mean, you could tell a lot about someone, obviously, from their DNA. And if they hold on to it, they could retest it over the years. So what are the dangers? What are the real dangers for using services like this? What should I be aware of? And then if, like many people out there have probably already done because they got it as a Christmas gift or whatever, if they've already used the service and submitted their DNA to one of these services, is there anything I can do about that after the fact? Can I have them delete my information? Has it already been passed on to five other people so it's too late? What What are your recommendations around that? Yeah, and I think um, what's interesting about genetic testing and what I've learned through the years is that everyone's assessment of their risk and what they think is worrisome about participating in genetic testing is highly variable and very unique to individuals. Overwhelmingly, you know, I give people the very basic and unhelpful advice that they should do their research and really understand what those risks are and which ones are important to them, and then see which services either appropriately mitigate those risks and protect their data or which don't. And sometimes the answer may be that they find the perfect service that works for them. And sometimes, you know, that's not the case and they they don't get comfortable with it. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of uh, the open market in this situation. But that's not to not to deflect or minimize the obligation that genetic testing companies have towards consumer data. I think some of the risks that that People have communicated to me on a regular basis that they're concerned about fall into a couple buckets. The first is that a, the data could illuminate information about my family that I didn't know and I'm not emotionally ready to know. And, um, you, you never think you're going to be the person that would learn, you know, that your, your Mm -hmm. dad is not actually your biological father, but, you know, sometimes that does happen and, and folks are obviously really impacted by it. The second thing that comes up a lot is access to law enforcement and whether or not either the government or um, the local police or FBI would get access to your genetic information. And the last one is um, how it could be monetized in order to benefit primarily pharma companies, because I think folks are worried that pharma companies are going to monetize their data um, and build drugs off of them. And I think I think there's a variety of companies out there that have set up protocols and have the appropriate ethical oversight to meet those to meet those uh, folks where they're at and say we've we've implemented the controls for it. It's never going to be a perfect insurance policy. Um, there's always going to be risks, and you know I think I think since consumer genetic testing came on the market, which has to be 15, 17, 20 years ago now, you know the industry mm-hmm. has really grown up and become very sophisticated. And there's now several state laws. Uh, California has a genetic information, genetic information privacy act and several other states do too. So it, it isn't the wild west that it once was, but it's not to say that, you know, people don't have a real reason to be worried. Thus far, some of those worries have become more of a reality than others. For example, the risk of finding out familial uh, background is something that I think is a real, real risk that happens um, to folks, uh, can happen to folks. Other of the risk of law enforcement getting access and, and the data being reused by the government, you know, overall, I haven't seen that really come to fruition in the same kind of way. And that's not to say that it won't someday. And um, if that's a risk you're not comfortable with. You should obviously make the choice to support your privacy in that capacity. But it just hasn't been the use case. Um, and I've, I've done a good amount of uh, self-study on just what kind of genetic data would and could be of interest to the government. What are the kind of use cases here? And for the most part in working, and, and frankly, the scientists at 23andMe were hugely helpful in educating me on this. A lot of the genetic data and the genetic analysis that are performed by these consumer companies are just not worthwhile um, and just not not useful for those but it's um hmm. it's certainly a really interesting space and as a lawyer certainly not the expert well the other thing i think people need to understand because just the way genes work is when you submit your dna you're also submitting the dna of your blood relatives right it's not just you that you're making this decision for it's them and, and that is actually and i think it was jed match it was our ancestry or 23 and me but some of these other genetic ancestry uh, services that share genetic information allowed law enforcement to catch criminals that were related 
to people who have submitted their DNA, for example. So that is at least one case, one scenario where the law enforcement angle comes into that. And it wasn't the people who submitted the DNA that ran into the problem. It was their relatives, right? Right. Absolutely. And I think um, if you do participate in a what's referred to an open database where it's searchable and accessible, that is certainly a risk that you should be aware of. And that is, that is again, really company specific. All right. Last couple of questions before you go. If uh, if you could write your own privacy law, if you could, if you had free reign to do it right and, and come up with it, what would be the main key provisions? What are we missing in privacy? I mean, obviously in the U.S. we're missing a lot of privacy regulations, but around medical stuff in particular, if you could kind of update HIPAA, what's missing? What, what would be some key provisions in an updated medical privacy law? I mean, the biggest thing I think would be to look for one medical privacy law to rule them all and quit the patchwork that doesn't really work Mm -hmm. and nobody understands and really have a clear and identifiable framework that applies to medical data regardless of who is processing it. I think that's the by far the biggest thing. And then secondarily, you know, have reasonable rules in place for how data is used and shared online. Um, I think for the most part, back end medical record data is is pretty well regulated but the the ancillary information that we described and you know internet usage data that can be used to infer sensitive health related data you know i think i think that could really use a clear set of requirements all right and last question what are what are your tips and tricks i mean are you, is your at the cocktail parties and so would say, hey, you're a, you're a medical lawyer person. What recommendations do you give to people to help them protect their medical privacy? And then as a follow up, if I think if I if I suspect that you know somebody has been less than careful with my medical information and it and it has leaked out or been abused, what what recourse do I have, if any? Yeah, I think circling back to kind of my earlier comments, my biggest tip and trick is a choose your healthcare services and interactions online really carefully. There's been a ton of really shiny new digital health services and websites that pop up and, um, and apps and apps and uh, wearables and all kinds of other things. So mm-hmm. they weren't all created equally. And you as a consumer, I think have to do a lot of work to really get to a place where you're making informed and educated decisions. And so take the time, uh, don't fall victim to the, to the click to purchase, um, so to speak. And then, the other one, you know, I think, um, I think especially as information has just gone online and digitized, my other, my other piece of advice to folks is really be careful about what you share and provide via social media and your online personas and other accounts because that information is going to be amalgamated into your medical, your medical data and sensitive files. So, you know, you, you have a part to play too. You're not obviously um, in full control, which is un- unfortunate, but to the extent that you are really, really be thoughtful about what information you're sharing, because just because you can't infer or don't intend to provide sort of medical or sensitive information doesn't mean that the companies that you're interacting with aren't making those inferences about you. And those around you, I mean, it's a, 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 on social totally. media, we tend to overshare. And, you know, including a picture with something in the background that might give something away or the location might give something away. And it's not just you you're doing it for. It's the, you know, the others as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So if so if I if I think that somebody has abused my data, if I think that someone has done bad things with my medical data or done things they shouldn't have done, what recourse do I have? Do I is there do I report this to the FTC? Could I go to my uh, state attorney general? Like what what do I do if I think that my medical information has been violated? Well, I think the first step is to contact um, the entity if there is a company, a provider, organization, website that you think has done wrong. You know, get in contact with them and see if they can provide you any sort of additional information. If um, if they can't or won't, um, and they are a HIPAA covered entity, you can submit a complaint to HHS. Um, they do a pretty good job, I think, of looking into those and following up on those, especially to the extent that they deem them a legitimate complaint. And then you can also uh, follow up with your state AG's office. I found that that has been less helpful um, hmm. generally, but um, it's worth doing, I think, especially if an AG starts to get a large amount of complaints hmm. about a particular entity. They're more likely to to um, investigate or, or open up a file about it. So um, that and then I'd say finally, you know, use your use your bully pulpit to the extent that you can be honest and telling other folks about it and uh 
and letting folks know who is not a trusted entity. Well, Kate, I could talk to you about this for hours and hours. Thank you for everything you've given us today. That was very, very informative. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks. You too. I want to thank Kate for coming on the show again. That was a very important discussion. And I learned a lot of things today that I did not know. And I hope that you did too. Our health data and, and medical records are can contain some extremely private information. And uh, they are under attack. Uh, we just had the ransomware attack on United Health Group, which could potentially give bad guys access to a lot of medical records. But that wouldn't be the first data leak. Uh, <laughs> there's been several. we we need to do a better job of taking care of securing our that medical data. And a lot of that's going to come from privacy regulations that require that. As we talked about today, it's really important when you start looking at third-party medical service providers, uh, especially some of these telehealth systems, that you do some research as best you can. I know it's not easy into whether or not these companies are even governed by HIPAA. And, and how do you tell that? Well, that's actually one of the questions I ask in some of the bonus content for the patrons, but I will give it some of here because I think it's important. Basically, Kate says, first of all, if you see a, some badge on the website that says HIPAA compliant, that that generally means nothing. And the FTC is actually asking companies not to put up any such badges because they're, they're kind of meaningless. What she recommends uh, that we get in the bonus content is a specific notice of privacy practices, uh, particularly something that has HIPAA specific privacy notice. Uh, and that should indicate that they are a quote unquote covered entity, but just be wary about the information you give out and, and to whom you give it. Again, we talked about some third parties who are doing check-ins for your appointments. That is probably not your doctor offering that service at some third party they're doing that through. And at least in my experience, some of them aren't even aware of who that company is, let alone what their, you know, their privacy policies are and whether or not they're governed by HIPAA. Some of the other things we talk about in the bonus content, which the patrons will be getting on Thursday as usual. We talk a little bit about some of the state laws, like the new one from Washington state called my health, my data act. And we also talk about some of the benefits of gathering all this data. I mean, again, I, I, I want to be clear that I'm not against data gathering, and I fully understand that there are massive benefits that could be had by collating and doing research on a lot of this aggregated data. We just have to do it in a way that protects our privacy. And in a lot of cases, actually anonymity, which is not easy to do. I mean, medical data is very personal. So, you know, sometimes it's almost trivially easy to re-identify supposedly anonymized data. So, but the benefits are, are definitely there and, and I don't want to downplay that. All right. Just a couple more quick things before we go. Uh, I will be announcing a new patron promotion, uh, a new promotion for patrons that actually will apply to existing patrons as well. And I'm planning on making this an ongoing thing. Basically, I want to put something in place that will be a be an ongoing benefit for my patrons. But for the kickoff of this promotion, I'm going to be doing a limited time thing where I'm going to be finally uh, giving away some of my super cool security enhancing dragon challenge coins. And if you missed out on that, if you haven't heard of these, go to fdsd.me, as in firewalls don't stop dragons, fdsd.me slash coin two, C-O-I-N and the number two. That will show you what they look like and, and talk about why they can be used to enhance your personal security and give you an idea of what I will be giving away. I plan to announce this promotion next week, so stay tuned for the details there. Also coming up, I will be making a return appearance on Malwarebytes Lock and Code podcast. Once that airs, I will definitely let you know and put a link in the show notes. And I've got a couple great interviews uh, waiting to go to air and a couple interviews I'll be doing this coming week for future episodes. One, I'm going to be talking to Seth for privacy on state-backed digital currency and, and what digital currency kind of means for us as a, as a society. And I've got a high-profile guest that I don't want to spoil just yet. I don't want to jinx it in case something goes wrong, but it, that should be happening this week too, hopefully. And once that's in the can, once I know I've got that one, I will tell you more about that one. All right, that's going to do it for this week. If you haven't already subscribed, now would be a great time to do that. That way you won't miss any of this great stuff coming down the pike. If you haven't given the podcast or the book a review on Amazon or iTunes, I would very much appreciate that as well. All right, take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. Thanks.